Hello, my name is Conrad Myers, co-founder and director of Aggregate Space Gallery. I'm wearing a light blue shirt, gray tie and vest. I have short dark hair, a bushy beard and dark glasses. I'm sitting in front of a white background. We acknowledge that Aggregate Space Gallery is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Chicano speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Oakland community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Um, thank you for attending this important programming. Um, this is the third of, of three panels and I've, I've um, uh, stayed out of aggregate promotion for the first two, but I, um, it, I would be remiss to mention that our aggregate's next exhibition is uh, an installation by Nassim Mokhadam called I Sprout on My Wound, and it will be opening next Friday, September 3rd, and running through the 23rd of October. Um, it's gonna be a, a new exhibition of Nassim's work that explores the impacts of restricted traditions and traumatic memories, envisioning another world, an equal world and solidarity. Magadam celebrates how women go beyond cultural and political limitations, rise up and create a revolution. I now would like to introduce Shaga Saruth, um, the designer and um, energy behind this entire project. Um, Shaheg Sarus is an Iranian-American multidisciplinary and social practice artist based in, Oakland, Cal uh, based in California. She studied MFA social practice in California College of the Arts and Visual Arts in, in Science uh, and Culture, University of Tehran. She was a creative dissent fellow led by Taini Pragura and contributed to Susan Lacey's We Are Here exhibition at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Sarus is a Gold Art Prize nominee and has exhibited and performed internationally at venues such as Tehran Mocha, British Museum in London, and Anchorage Museum in Alaska. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kara, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining the third and the last panel discussion of the Zamin project. I am an Iranian woman with brown hair, shoulder length, and uh, down look, uh, wearing black with a white background. Uh, Zamin project is a vir virtual multifaceted art project aiming to create a space for intergenerational dialogue and connection between Swana, Southwest Asia, and North African artists, curators, and art educators in the Bay Area and beyond. This series is aiming to focus on the question of how can we create our own resources uh, by gathering Swana artists, educators, and art leaders to develop a solution for enriching the community in the Bay Area. The project included three intergenerational virtual panel discussions all moderated by one and only Rula Segali with topics of Swana in the Bay Area, what is Swana, Swana art leaders and institutions, which the recording of both panels are available on Aggregate Space Gallery's YouTube channel. Um, and we will share the link with you all in the chat um, in, a sh uh, in a short time. Um, and the last panel today uh, is Swana teaching pedagogy and mentorship, which um, we will introduce you to the panelists shortly. The program also includes 15 artist interviews. Uh, artists include Misha Abbas, Zolfagar Ali Bhutto, Anam Awan, uh, Katayun Bahrami, Zaina Barake, Ali Dadgar, Manar Arb, Kiana Honarmand, Nassim Mogaddam, Omar Mohammed, Efe Ozman, Ibtahal Shedid, Kayvan Shovir, B Sisters, and Minush Zomaradinia. The interviews will be published one at a time from September 1st to September 25th on Aggregate Space Gallery's YouTube channel and Zamin's uh, project Instagram. Also, one of the focus of the Zamin project is resources. We are gathering information from Swana artists, educators, and art leaders in the Bay Area through a Google, through a Google form. The form aims to create an ongoing archive of Swana artists and advocates, list of Swana businesses and nonprofit organizations suggested by the Swanas in the Bay Area and other resources within the community. 
If you are a SWANA artist, educator, and or, or art leader, please fill out the form. The link will be available also in the chat. And you can also check Zamin's project Instagram for uh, to access the link. Thank you, Aggregate Space Gallery and their team and California Arts Council and all individuals who supported making this project happen. I am honored to introduce our panelists um, for um, this panel. Um, Tara Nehemami works with materials of history, collecting stories, organizing images, data, and information weaving complementary and contradictory narratives that re reveal complex relations, relationships and connections across cultures and nations. She creates projects that offer opportunities for creative exchange between various communities, collaborating with artists and scholars through residencies and collective projects. A collective projects across uh, connections uh, Connections Project at Center for the Arts and Public Life at CCA, uh, Theory of Survival at the Lab and YBCA and um, other projects as well. Um, Kathy Zarur. Is, um, Kathy Zarur uh, is Associate uh, Professor of Art History at Skyline College and a curator and, co uh, and conference organizer in San Francisco Bay Area. Zarur exhibitions include pre-occupations Palestine landscapes, Minnesota Street Project San Francisco, and Holding House Detroit. Um, side by side in the world uh, San Francisco Art Commission uh, between scapes, SOMARS for Asian Pacific Islander, um, Pacific Islander Cultural Center and uh, Kearney Street Workshops. Welcome, Kathy and Tarno. Um, Shole Askari is an Iranian-born interdisciplinary sound artist whose practice is shaped by her early somatic experiences as a refugee. Uh, situating the body as a site of knowledge, her immersive works, performances and audience, uh, participatory scores implicate, implicate the viewer participant into future mythological excavations, um, bridging large swaths of time uh, and history through water, water clocks, crude oil, uh, movement, light, ima imaging, voice, and sound. She has exhibited and performed at various institutions, including ERAS, um, Kant's Museum, uh, Southwest Institute, Institute of Art and Minnesota Street Project. Welcome, Shole. And um, Adin Saraj. Adin Saraj is an Iranian native and Canadian uh, citizen who currently lives in the United States. Her video, photography, and multimedia installations reflect the uh, varied uh, textures of her transitional experience of displacement and alienation by also of unexpected connections. She uses uh, sound and images to create vir uh, visually and socially large experiences, layering space and multiple time frame with, uh, time frames with an interdisciplinary approach and marginali marginalized experiences. Sarah uh, explore explores connections between colonial history, citizen journalism, activist network and contemporary politician in politics in the Southwest Asia, South Asia and North African diaspora. Welcome, Ozin. Thank you. Sorry, shall we describe our... Um... Okay, so um, I have a, this is Azeen, and I have a short asymmetrical hair with salt and pepperish, and then um, wearing a navy blue button-up shirt with some kind of a white background with some um, art on the wall. Thank you. Kathy, want to go next? Hi, I am a brown-skinned woman with 
a half black and half white hair, and I'm wearing a light colored shirt and a blurry background. I'll go next. Hi, I'm Shola, and I am an Iranian woman uh, with medium uh, skin, and I have short, curly black hair to the side, a white shirt, and a blurry, foggy background. Hi. Um, I am sitting in front of a very blurred background. I'm Tarane with uh, gray hair, very short these days wearing a light <laughs> pair of glasses and a gray shirt. Great, so let's start um, with the first question, just for the audience's um, information. We're gonna take turns asking each other questions. We are a group of people who know each other pretty well. So we're hoping this is gonna be casual, fun and uh, fruitful. That's, that's my expectation. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Sharaya for this beautiful project and aggregate space for hosting California Arts Council for um, the grant support. Um, so the first question that we should all ask ourselves and talk about is, um, how did you, we, start building community? Whoever would like to go first. I can start. Um, so yeah, I had to think about that. I mean, reflect on that a little bit. Um, the short answer I want to say is like Tarana <laughs> was a was a beacon in the Bay Area for me. But uh, the the long I think answer for me a reflection on that question. Um, would be from a very personal standpoint. And so for me, finding community actually took a long time. And building it has been an ongoing organic process, um, one you know that involves nurturing, imagining, and modeling with each other. Um, so I came to the Bay Area, I don't know, almost two, I don't even know, a decade, two decades ago or something. And from La by way of Los Angeles. And um, in both places, I felt very much sort of out of place or not in community within SWANA identifying folks. And um, in Los Angeles, I never really fit in with a general or larger Iranian population or community. And I think a lot of this was due to my own, um, my own background, uh, my family's political background, my own background um, as well. And, um, and I came from a very, I was a very young refugee, came from a very small family unit and our chosen family were, um, came from this activist background, which didn't really fit with that larger narrative. But I also didn't even know that, that this other narrative existed. So in a way, it also later on became a lesson of learning that there are so many different identities and that like Iranian isn't a monolith, Swana isn't a monolith, and that people come from all kinds of backgrounds. So that actually took a long time to sort of feel and learn. Um, but I think when I came to the Bay Area, um, the higher I, I started studying art here and the higher I moved through the sort of institution or art education, the wider it became. And, um, and is it, and so the wider those spaces that I moved and I occupied were, and so eventually this took a toll on me. You know, the microaggressions uh, take a toll and, you know, the non-microaggressions and uh, the sort of the, the lack of access and social support as well takes a toll after a while. And so by the time I finished grad school, I actually felt very much isolated in some ways. And, um, and I think that's really when I began to... Um, uh, both a lot of my community, the few people I had had moved away by then or to grad school or after grad school, but that's really where I began to um, reflect on what I missed and wanting to build it. And it really became as simple as sort of like Tarone's name being a beacon <laughs> and gravitating towards Tarone and knowing this is somewhere safe. This is someone safe. This is someone that sees me and that gets me. And I think, um, and then from there, I feel it was kind of, I don't know, like, I'd say a magpie or this sort of snowballing, just gathering everyone along the way as we move through. Um, and I think also this process of realization led to, um, when I was at Incline Gallery, I was a co-director and curator and 
uh, ran this internship program, uh, which Shirin was on the previous panel, was uh, interning. And being in that space really drove me to make the spaces or be part of the spaces that I couldn't necessarily be part of. And I think that also kind of opened up. While it wasn't Swana specific, it opened up this um, opportunity or permission to myself that we don't have to exist in the spaces that don't exist for us. <laughs> But I'm curious, yeah, because Ozzy and we finished, yeah, maybe school around the same time and we were both transplants here. That is correct. No, I, I, I really like, um, very much relate to what you said. Um, and I definitely second you and Tarana being the beacon. And um, I felt like, uh, um, yeah, that's a definitely short answer, but that going a little bit more personal, um, uh, I was born in Iran and raised there. So my community was very much by default, like people that my family and extended family friends were a part of. And when I moved to Canada, um, I had to start from like ground zero, pretty much like many immigrants um, and transnational citizens uh, experienced that. So I think that, you know, I was in early, my early twenties and it was definitely, uh, a, a very challenging time because I wasn't really sure what um, um, field of study I wanted to um, um, pursue. Um, and of course, you know, just, I mean, just a little like cliche thing with Persians, you know, lawyer, engineer, doctors, whatever, but that was something that I was not, um, it didn't, I, I remember going to college and taking many different classes and didn't really click. And I just took, um, a class of art history um, that um, my um, instructor uh, gave a, um, a, a project and I decided to do photography um, for that. And that kind of like snowballed to uh, a, you know, me applying for um, school and University of Victoria. But yet yeah, um, the community, uh, I think that it took a long time to to form. Definitely, I would say the first community as I felt connected to were artists and continue to be the case. Um, but kind of coming to um, to learn and 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 to be introduced to Suwana and my own people, um, that was just something a a very strong need that I didn't have the vocabulary or understanding for it at the time. I felt like I was sort of straddling between. Um, the sort of boundaries of integration and assimilation because a lot of people around me were um, not necessarily from my own diaspora. Um, I just happened to be in Victoria that a lot of, um, you know, uh, non-brown people were a part of. So anyways, when I came to the Bay Area, um, and I think that started to meet more people from Swana and definitely I would say Tarana and Tarana is this magnet that I bring a lot of artists together and, and a lot of more people than that, that desire became much uh, stronger for me. And it became, it's very strong me that I want to have this community around me. It's not about like, you know, similarities necessarily, it's about the diversity that I diaspora offers that I'm very attracted to. So. Um, yeah, and then just creating home away from home. I think that a lot of us relate to this um, one way or another. Um, and it feels great to, to be a part of this panel and then continue to expand that community. Tana, we talked a lot about this and you put, put you, <laughs> I don't wonder if you have any uh, response to our fan mail. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so lucky to have had the opportunity to work with all of you. It's been really a privilege. And in terms of how to build community, um, the main question that we've had is, I would say, reaching out <laughs> and like seeking people who, um, amongst the artists, um, especially people who uh, speak the same language and have the same kind of historical connections and context. Um, it seems like um, that was something that I was always seeking in the many years before I met you <laughs> too. And um, um, it, be it has become kind of the main core of my practice. So I bring community through my work now and it defines what I do. I mean, now I talk about my own practice as a platform for connection and platform to bring people together. So that definitely has been really important to me personally to find a 
a place of connection with these you beautiful people and artists that I've had the privilege of working with. Uh, but it has come from a you know desperate need <laughs> more than anything else. Um, I have a slightly different um, history from all of you. I mean, maybe make very different because I came like 20 years before all of you to the Bay Area. And um, my community definitely was other immigrants from Iran. You know, that definitely was something that I needed uh, to be connected with very much activist community as well. And in those very difficult years after the revolution, that was my savior because there was no news from Iran. We didn't you know, necessarily trust the media, not that we do now, but you know, definitely then there was hardly anything. And they became the source for information, the force, source for connection and um, you know, trying to understand where I am sort of came through um, that community that really was uh, was there for all of us. And um, what I've tried to do was amongst other, you know, the art community was to create our own um, sense of community among artists that are coming from that region. Um, and I do refer to it as the region <laughs> more than anything else. But um, and so uh, I'm glad to see us growing into a real sense of community now. So Kathy, please. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. You know, I, I think I'm a little, um, my, my experience is different because I was born in San Francisco and I have a very large extended um, community um, here, a Palest Palestinian American community that I don't necessarily um, connect with in the same way that I connect with um, you guys. And similar, uh, Shole, interestingly, I, I don't know what it is, but I also feel totally out of place, right? Like in whatever community I'm with, and it's kind of like, you know, um, this, this probably my lifelong work. And so, you know, when I first saw the question, I was preparing for it, you know, I made a list like, oh, I collaborate, I co-curate, I connect with organizations, I attend events and all this stuff. But then I realized actually, you know, what's a, an important part of building community is to feel um, okay with yourself first and foremost. So, you know, I'm going to bring up my favorite topic, um, which is, you know, mental health um, is super important because it's hard to reach out if you're feeling scared, you know? And so, you know, that part, you know, that, that work has been um, and continues to be an important part of how I make community. And also with my students, you know, I talk about mental health all the time. It's not easy to put yourself out there. It's not easy to make mistakes. It's not easy to allow yourself to be a learner, you know, to admit that you are a learner and that, you know, life is a process. So um, I try to, I try to um, be gentle and um, compassionate with myself in that regard so that I can be the same with others as I, um, you know, strengthen my connections with this. Um, incredible community, that word that, you know, we use so, so often, but um, is sometimes elusive, you know, even if um, in, in reality, you know, we are part of a community. So thanks. That was really great. Azine, you want to go ask the next yeah, question? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, and so this question actually is a nice uh, uh, sort of continuation of what you mentioned. Um, so I'd love to know uh, uh, about like, did you work with mentors? I mean, obviously, I would say yes, but did you work with mentors and how did the experience influence your personal and professional growth? Can I go first? Um, yeah, mentorship was, I, I didn't realize it at, at, at the beginning, but you know, I had two really important, I've had many, but two really important mentors. The first um, is Judith Bettelheim, who taught um, Caribbean art at San Francisco State University. And she um, was a no not, she was the person who said, oh, you should do a PhD. No one had ever said anything like that to me before. Um, in art history, you know, like, like, okay, what me, you know, it was incredible. So and then she was, you know, a 
pretty no nonsense about, um, okay, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to um, be. This is, you know, this is how you write. This is how you present yourself. This, you know, so like very directed um, help. And then the next person I want to uh, mention is Jacqueline Francis, who is at um, the California College of the Arts, where I used to teach. And, um, you know, Jacqueline's approach is, um, really different, but there's some over, there's some overlap. Uh, Jackie um, is, you know, she let, she guided me. She um, acted as an example, and she let me make mistakes and was super gentle <laughs> about it. You know, like uh, to make a mistake and to say, "Wow, I kind of messed up," and and you know, not have that totally destroy me uh, is is amazing. So I strive to find um, a combination, you know, to to bring those two um, together, and um, but also to recognize that um, different people respond to different styles. So you know, I've been hearing a lot like, oh, maybe you should uh, change your style a little depending on the person's needs. So <laughs> trying to do that kind of thing as well. I'll, I'll um, you know, I, I think, as you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned gentle, the sort of like gentleness. Um, so one of my mentors, um, and not in, not in the Swana community, but was very gentle and I, I really actually didn't even realize that he was a mentor <laughs> until much later. And it was just the sudden looking back after grad school and after some years and realizing, wow, he's been there pushing me all along uh, very gently and uh, never making me feel like I have to perform my like identity or I have to do something specific to fit somewhere. and. Um, it, it was Louis DeSoto from San Francisco State University. Um, that's where I went to undergrad. So I'm familiar. I had a class with Judith Bettelheim, and Judith was just amazing and a mentor to a few people I knew. Um, uh, made me even wish to go into art history and <laughs> taking Judith's class. That was what, in effect, she had. Um, but yeah, so Louis DeSoto was really just there all along, um, gently guiding me, pushing me, encouraging me. Uh, connecting me to things that I didn't even know were there. And I think that it was that gentleness of sort of not even realizing that there's been this sort of like hand that has your back throughout these years. And, um, and I thought that was really, really beautiful. And I think it also taught me a lot about, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, mentorship in different ways, right? There's the immediate help and the immediate things as well, but there's also that long-term support and uh, holding space for someone's uh, development and growth as an artist and being invested in them. Um, it's not only, not only an artist, I would say, but also as a person. So, you know, knowing that the mentorship wasn't like hinged upon my success, it was really based upon, um, my health as a person, you know, overall, and my art and my practice being one facet of that. Um, I think, yeah, that's what I, I, I would say. And I, I think from that experience, I think like definitely, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I guess I can go next. Um, uh, so, uh, I um, I could think of two um, two mentors that have really um, shaped um, not only my art practice um, not shaped but very like so with their support I um, I felt more courageous to take these bold steps um, but also seeing them in classrooms were incredibly inspiring and to me uh, as an educator to see how um, how does one, like, how does an educator develop relationship with students? How does that sort of notion of caring come to place? Um, so Linda Gammon, um, she was in my undergrad and, um, and she, uh, really, um, helped me to, um, uh, to, um, um, learn about my own, my own self and, and how to self-actualize before creating art so having like creating art that it's just very much about my own story and how do I 
share that story, that language. Um, and Catherine Sherwood in my graduate school here, um, she uh, taught at um, UC Berkeley and I was very fortunate and lucky to be able to end up taking the TA for her, but then later co-teach with her. Um, so um, uh, that, I think that just think about being beyond, like as a student, I was, I had my own perspective of like what mentorship meant, but then while I started teaching, then I, I, I got to see also from the other side that it's like a mutually beneficial, um, meaningful relationship that you have with mentor, mentee. And, um, and there are of course, you know, the um, mentors that I had not seen in person, for example, Bell Hooks and Sister Corita Kent, um, you know, so like, you know, to just, I think that I, what is very inspiring to me, one of the, um, uh, Bell Hooks calls uh, engaged pedagogy, which is very much about um, the the meaningful relationship that um, you know mentor and mentee develop, and it's very much about caring that holistic approach that um, you see students as, as 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 people, not just this you know the attendees to your class, and sort of and again enable and help students to to um, like fit, like to find their own voices and. Um, foster that in my classroom. So I think that that is just very like, and then Karen looks very different. Sometimes it looks like, you know, um, you know, make making a potluck. Well, sometimes it looks like a student just need to like, you know, um, you can help them uh, uh, with their projects. So it, it it that's very much something that for me that I I feel a lot of inspiration to see that mentors have. Um, influence and inspired me and I would love to do that service in return to my students. I don't know, Julie. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, yeah, I, a lot of different people are coming to my mind as you talk about um, your mentors. I had a um, real good fortune of working with really amazing people during graduate school at CCA, um, California College of the Arts at the time. And especially I was going through a difficult time emotionally and personally was my, during that time I visited Iran for the first time after like 13 years. And um, it really shifted me and kind of disrupted my everyday quite a bit. And it was Margaret McKenzie who was teaching an anthropologist who was teaching at CCA at the time who I was working with on my thesis, who was there with her support and care and really worked with uh, me to um, that last year of my school wouldn't have happened <laughs> without her. And it, later on, and I mean, that relationship has continued to this day and I'm very fortunate to benefit from that, but it really was her that introduced me to uh, Sonia Manion, who was running the Center for Art and Public Life at CCA and um, who invited me to do Cross Connections, which is one of the projects that brought a lot of artists together. I had the good fortune of working with Persis Karim, another relationship that has continued to uh, today. We've been able to do a lot together uh, throughout the years. And I learned so much from Sonia and uh, the uh, year that I worked at, at the center with her um, shaped my community projects in ways that has continued to benefit uh, myself, but also has helped in kind of building a community in ways that I couldn't have imagined when I started. Um, I really appreciated that she trusted me, <laughs> even though I'm, I may have not known what the hell I was doing, but she trusted me to um, bring my community who, you know, she might have had not um, the same connections to the community or understanding of the community, but she trusted me with, with uh, doing the right thing. And um, yeah, it's been so many people, um, but um, I want to name those two amazing women. Oh, and I'm asking the, the third question, actually. Um, and it's a continuation of the same question is what makes mentorship an important resource in the Bay Area Swana community? For each of you. I'll start if no one else wants to. Um, you know, I think um, it has been mentioned already that, you know, in our, in, in the Swana community, um, 
maybe more so in the diaspora. I'm not totally sure it'd be interesting to do a comparison. Um, work in the arts and culture field is not encouraged, right? So um, we, we're actually a pretty small um, cohort of, of um, culture workers. And so I think that it's really important if you, you know, if, if, if to support um, people um, of, of younger generations or even the same generation, whatnot, who want to go into the, into the arts and um, what, what that means for me to support, you know, like I'm often very cautious about it and pretty straightforward, like, you know, it's hard to make a living um, and, you know, in some cases people say, well, I want to get a PhD. And I said, okay, well, do you have a trust fund? <laughs> because, uh, it's expensive to live in the Bay area, for example, and, um, it's hard to get through. So, but still, you know, I, I, you know, I've been, um, so fortunate to work with people who are really, really dedicated, um, and I pass on, um, as much, um, support. Um, and opportunities as I can. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, for me, mentorship is not limited to the Swana community. And, you know, in my classes, I like to emphasize um, shared experiences, you know, like the impact of imperialism, um, for example, or, you know, power in whatever way it manifests. And so, for example, um, it was last semester, I think, no, two semesters ago at Mills College, I had a student from Central America who said to me, I have never it was a class on modern art in the Middle East or in the Swana region. She said, I have never learned about anything outside of European art. And I'm so inspired and I'm really moved. And I've had a lot of people who are not Swana, um, descent, descendant of the Swana um, region, um, similarly kind of um, gravitate towards me because I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to expand art history um, be, beyond the traditional canon. Um, it's, it's much easier to do that in contemporary art, but, you know, my experience working um, internationally in um, Palestine and in the United Arab Emirates, um, I've been able to um, kind of talk a little bit about you know, the international, uh, in, the, the production of international global exhibitions. And um, I, I mostly do that with my students in the classroom. Um, I, I, I tend to compartmentalize in a weird way. I'm, you know, like thinking now I don't really um, do that. I don't, I don't make those connections um, all the time. I'm unable to do that somehow, but yeah, so um, yeah, I'm just looking back at the question. Yeah, I think that I think that's it. <laughs> there you go. I'd love to follow what, what follow up with that. Um, so, uh, uh, what makes a mentorship important resource in the Swana community in the Bay Area or beyond? Um, uh, I think that there is like a growing need to deassemble like the colonial image of of immigrant community, especially like I can speak for my own like region diaspora as a war and born terrorist third world, you name it. I think that um, I, and to, in a way to celebrate, like bring this um, pedagogy into my classrooms that um, uh, creates a holistic model of learning that, you know, everyone grows and in, feels empowered and, and, um, and also, uh, uh, how to um, how to learn? Because I, I teach mainly video production, video related, you know, digital media. So it's a lot about storytelling, and it's a lot about how and who tells our our stories, like stories by whom, by and then uh, what stories, um, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I think that it's it's just very important to. Um, to really deconstruct this dominant narratives that are are um, as a part of like you know just the way that we're our cultures are introduced to 
I can speak like sort of Western in, in here. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and not just, uh, so I don't just focus on Swana communities in my classes. I think that is just, uh, just by who I am by default, it, it a kind of, I, I focus and, and try to like refuse to conform with that expectations of like, you know, like the Eurocentric model of teaching or like focus. So I, I would like to, I mean, I focus on bringing diversities and making sure that, that people who have been left uh, you know, behind from these like dominant narratives, like to really bring that focus. So I think that um, that is very an essential like tool when I teach in, and what happens in my classrooms is to like, um, and, and so to again, yeah, so let, in the bring the diversities and the overlaps in and, um, and the differences together. And, and, and also try to like move away from tokenizing, you know, just like, you know, like, just running big people having a show together about this thick like, theme of like this, or like, you know, Alice, you know, I, I think that um, we're expected to always talk in certain languages like political or social um, for better or worse. So I think that, you know, just we're, we're trying to figure that and investigate that as we speak. So, um, so yeah, I think that it's just, it's, it's very important to, um, um, bring that diversity into classes. Um, and, uh, and you know, I just, I just think of like, a, also my positionality as like a media artist, teacher. Um, I remember like I had an, 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 uh, a student from, from like the Swana diaspora and she, she told me, it's like, I have not, like, it's like having you as a teacher, like to be who you are, like, you know, by, you know, like where you're from, like, and just like that kind of connections, like that makes me feel like I can see a future, like for myself, I want to teach. And that meant so, that was so meaningful to me to, to like, you know, that's, there is like, you know, we also represent communities that have been not necessarily a, a big part of the education system, not that they are less deserving, it's because of just, again, that domination of who gets to teach, who gets to be in that position of power. So uh, I think that's refreshing to, to um, I mean, also be a part of this panel that is definitely like, you know, you can see that different generations, but like, you know, from this one perspective. Can I jump in, um, Azin? you said something that made me realize like I, th I, I am the only art historian in the group and art history is, um, you know, it's a discipline. It's a, I, ha I have a love hate relationship mm. art history because it was born during your, you know, the height of European colonialism. And so, you know, what is taught in a survey course, right? Like arts of Asia, for example, um, is essentially the art of the powerful, right? Mm. The, the leaders, the dominating um, religious institutions. And so um, currently I'm at a community college, I'm at Skyline College, and it's a very interesting position to be in because on the one hand, pedagogically, it's important that I find a way to make the content relevant to um, my students, a lot of whom are Filipino, for example. And so, um, but art history, you know, you look at any art history book of arts of Asia and there's nothing about the Philippines in there, right? Because it's the canon, right? So it's like all of the important big objects. Um, and so, and yet then, <laughs> Like it gets really complicated and I'm, I'm just like starting to really sink my teeth into how to figure this out. But so, you know, in order for a community college class to be transferable to the California State University or to UC Berkeley, for example, or the UC system, you have to teach a certain, you know, you have to teach the canon. Um, and so, okay, like, okay, I'm gonna teach the canon and how am I gonna bring in the Philippines? And how am I going to bring in um, 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 Mongolia, for example? I mean, I can teach the Mongols, but like in a contemporary context, right? And so I, I, I think a lot about, you know, how to, how to balance the pressures of having to teach, you know, what everyone is sort of expected to know, but then how to create a pedagogy that is, um, as they call it, responsive to the students' needs um, 
and also disruptive, you know, how to be, how to, you know, disrupt this power, this construct of power, um, even as we are looking back at history to do it. I'll, I'll follow up on that. That That is a real challenge, Kathy, <laughs> specifically within the department and the survey type of course, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're teaching. Um, I'm really, yeah, curious, and I'm sure we'll continue the conversation beyond the panel I'm, uh, to, to sort of know or learn what you're doing or how you're handling it. Um, I think responding to uh, both Ozina and Kathy, um, uh, I, so I teach uh, global perspectives and contemporary art at UC Berkeley, and so this is a seminar course. And um, and I uh, and I've taught a few types of these courses elsewhere, and it's definitely I think uh, it's a challenge, but it's also I think like really exciting. So I don't think that you know I don't have necessarily the kind of specific container, right? Um, that your course does, Kathy, within that, but within uh, within the course that I'm teaching, it's even questioning with students, like, what do we mean by global? Um, what does that actually mean? What do we mean by perspectives? Uh, what perspective are we talking about in contemporary? What is contemporary even, right? Contemporary coming upon this history. And um, and, and, and art, right? So what is considered art, what's not? So even when it comes to contemporary sort of works, it's, it's, it's a question of like, well, what are we actually considering to be art of today? And what are we considering to be like not art of today? Um, as well as, uh, you know, as well as the art of today, what is it responding to, right? It, it, it may, you know, so, so how do we also not retokenize something when we're looking at it essentially? And, um, and I think like a lot of this for me has been very, it's very exciting because a lot of it is really built through classroom dialogue and through discussion and just engaging through discussion and um, and moving forward based on questions that we ask um, in that sense. Um, and I think that for me, a lot of this sort of approach also comes from my own background, you know, like Kathy and I, you and I related about that of sort of like feeling out of place or kind of like off or something. Um, and, and I think that for me, I look at both in my teaching and my pedagogy, whether it's a studio class or a seminar class or a history class, I've taught like history of photography and this and that, it's, it's, I try my best to really approach it from an intersectional perspective, which is really also, uh, I think like uh, an extension of the way that I approach my interdisciplinary studio practice. And this is with the sort of acknowledging that we are always leaving something out, right? In order to make space for something and to name something means that we are immediately also, you know, we have a blind spot and we're leaving something else out. And so it's a sort of like ongoing process. Um, but I have a little bit of that, you know, freedom in terms of the course container, uh, which makes it different. Um, but I think that in terms of, um, uh, as a teacher, I really often reflect um, when it comes to sort of mentorship being an important resource in the sort of Swana Bay Area community. I reflect a lot on what I didn't have and uh, sometimes on what I still don't have. And I really use that is, you know, a way to model and a way to build and a way to open up those things that I wish I could see and a way to open up spaces where, you know, things that I also can't see can exist or flourish or emerge or, you know, sort of be born. And, um, and I think it's so important to have representation on, on, on one hand within these places and these institutions, like there was no one that looked like me when I went to art school, no one. And that has a lot of implications, you know, and still there's very few people who look like us. Um, and it's a challenge, it's, it, it's huge. Um, and, and I can also see it in my students, you know, when I have a student who's Iranian or a student who's from the Swana region, I can see the way that their eyes light up. <laughs> when they see me in person or they read my name, their eyes light up, they email me right away. They email me more. And, and, and it's just like, I could see that. And I, you know, and I know that I would have felt that when I was going through school to have that. And, and, and also, you know, I think like both of you, like this aspect of mentorship extends beyond the Swana region and it encompasses all of my students um, from all types of backgrounds and experiences. Um, and I think that's what's 
uh, yeah, I think when we're from various backgrounds and different communities and, you know, we're thinking about like BIPOC folks and such, I mean, I've had students come like asking me like recently to be their mentor and, you know, they didn't even need the class that I was teaching, but they took it because they wanted me to be their mentor. And, and I remember like having meetings with them and like one day they were literally breaking down in tears about some of the things that they were facing. And I remember completely just thinking, wow, I was at the brink of tears, like literally this morning, because I was facing the same things, <laughs> you know, <laughs> facing these same aspects. Yeah. Thank so you so much, Shulich. And that I, I wanted to actually continue that conversation about have, holding space for those conversations and, and bringing, um, you know, making a space for intergenerational conversations as well as conversations across diaspora communities, um, and sort of like what we're doing here, sort of what, what Aggregate and uh, Shagayak have, have been able to create for us here. Um, that was something that Kathy and I tried to do with Shagayak at CTA, for instance, for many years. And, and I think it's so important for, uh, students who, especially international students, who are coming directly from the region, from all these different parts, you know, 30 some countries <laughs> that we're now calling the region, um, the Suana region, and that come to the US and really have very little information about others in the region. And that does become a conversation that needs to happen. And we, there's so much assumptions. It's not as if like we were talking about, we're not a monolithic community by any means. And we have a, a lot of conflict, political conflict, and you know, a lot of um, conversations to be had amongst ourselves, as well as um, bringing those conversations outwards, like we're trying to do here as well. So uh, really appreciate all that is being said and all that you're doing in your own roles. Thank you. I know we have a couple of other questions still and we're running a little short on time. So Sholijan, do you wanna read that next question? Yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, our final question, um, and then we have the other questions, one or two questions in the chat is, um, has the shift uh, from using the Middle East uh, and Armena, Armena descriptions uh, been met with resistance in your classroom? And when did you start using SWANA in your teaching and writing? I'm gonna take this one. So my students love it. They love being critical. They love learning about, um, you know, I always ask, I always say to my students, how do we know what we know? right? Who, where did this information come from? It wasn't just born, right? It's born out of a specific perspective. And so, you know, if, if you start, even though that's a really big kind of general broad um, question, if you start with that, then they're like, whoa, mind blown. At the same time, um, most people have no idea what the hell I'm talking about when I say SWANA. Um, so I always have to put in parentheses, otherwise known as, you know, Middle East. Um, and then, you know, I explain. Um, or I say West Asia or Southwest Asia. And if they're at all geographically inclined, which is kind of not often the case, sadly, um, then, you know, they might figure out, oh, Middle East. Swana. So um, they have, they've been into it. Um, and I'm, I'm currently, I'm in this really incredible situation right now where like I'm the art historian in my department. So I can, um, you know, I have the freedom to create courses. So one of the courses we're talking about making is, has traditionally been referred to as Islamic art, right? even though you know the art that we're looking at in a class that is called that is not always religious you know so how do we you know what so it's, it's a, so it's an incredible um it's an incredible opportunity um for brainstorming and and thinking outside the box and my students really like it
I'll go. <laughs> oh, go. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, actually totally um, opposite, Kathy, of you. Um, but I also teach different, right? You're, you're within art history. Um, I teach within studio arts. And so um, within studio arts, I actually never had that shift from the terminologies because I actually never necessarily used uh, Mina to begin with. And um, also don't tend to use Swana in terms of teaching. So I don't necessarily teach about Swana. I'll teach with artists. Um, and, and that's, I think, more specific to the courses and the way that I teach. So a lot of times when I do that, I'm focusing on the specificity in terms of time and place of each artist, um, which is, right, of course, inseparable from geopolitics and such. And so, and I apply this to the authors as well. Um, so I tend to organize them based on concepts that have the potential for discovery of inter intersections. So like what happens when we cross Orientalism with like a queer artist? What happens when we cross these things together and what do we discover within that? Um, and so, you know, otherwise I'll use Swana for myself or other artists as, you know, really shorthand for the regional or I would say Indies works or Black of legibility. Um, that's, that's pretty much more the way that I do. And the one thing I would add on is that um, I recognize that there's sort of aspects that won't ever be legible, um, even if we put that container on it, even if we put that on it. So it's not working against that. It's being very careful of how I am grouping concepts uh, versus like identifiers and the relationship between the two. Don't tear off as in John, go for it. <laughs> I was just going to say between you two. No, you actually should go because you tar off already with, with Shole, so I will go last. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sort of in the same position as Shole in a way that I don't necessarily directly teach about art history, even though I do cover a lot of artists in, in my classes. Uh, I do always bring up where um, Middle East terminology comes from, because I think uh, it's important for them. That question that you've asked, Kathy, I think I'm going to start my class this semester on Thursday with that question. <laughs> it's so important. And uh, to, just to give context, I think it does uh, open up conversations because, you know, it's not just Middle East, but Far East and all of those that... Um, are basically, um, uh, you know, are supposed to be there to represent us, that do a disservice to who we are as uh, the region and our individual um, relationship to the region, basically. So Azinjan, go for it. We're kind of Chash, at the Chash. Time. <laughs> Yes, um, no, I, my, I don't have a long answer, but I would say like I definitely um, always talk about Swana uh, in my class it may, mainly in the context when I show um, artists, like the artists work from the region, then I would specify where they're from. And, you know, I, I think that my students uh, are on board with that. But you know what I love doing is actually in conversation with like, just people in like different walks of life and you know, I meet them in the street or whatever. As soon as the words, oh yeah, they're Middle Eastern and then I get on the Swana thing. It's like, I love policing people that way and just give it to them. And you know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, it just think like, they a lot of people don't just admit it's, oh, I never thought of it that way. It's like, so um, yeah, that, I think that I have a very um, <laughs> hyper, active practice outside of classrooms about the terminology Swana versus but uh, and you know and of course everything else is in, in you know related to okay you know everything that we've talked about so yeah um so if you see me in the street and if you use the middle east then you know that i'm gonna come after you <laughs> okay well with that said i think that's a good time to move to a q a um since it's three o'clock actually oh. azim we've been given the green light to ask the last question on oh okay which right is um, how do you define resources in terms of the Swana community, both in and out of the Bay Area? Uh, 
I'm not so sure if I understand the question so much. How do we define the resources or? Or maybe uh, identify, you can identify, um, yeah. But, you know, what is the resource? Yeah, we could just kind of riff. I mean, should we name some places as I a resource? In the previous, um, in previous. Um, yeah, with Targol and, and, you know, and, and the first panel, yes. I mean, I would say Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies at um, State, definitely no person's training, she's the director of that amazing resource. Also, Shagir just uh, sent a note saying the resources. Oh, you muted yourself. Sorry. <laughs> you muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was re uh, referencing Shagir's note that it's specific to you. Like, what are the resources? Um, what, are, what has been your resources? <laughs> so um i okay so i'd like to answer this question because you know i think that you know what i would like to see this is maybe more of a wishful thing rather than <laughs> um you know i'd like Sorry. to see people in the in my community you know to supporting this work right um like Anyways, uh, I, I don't want to get too personal, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. You know, people are really excited. Oh, you have a PhD and you have this and you're doing this and you're doing that. And, you know, like um, help creative people make it happen. It's not, you know, we need to pay rent. Um, and, and, you know, just to be like kind of crass. But the other thing that um, I want to say is that for me, what's, in, what's an important resource, and maybe this is even more important, is um, how I and we connect with other communities so that we, you know, based on similar, um, not identical, but overlapping experiences. So I've been so inspired and moved by the connections between Black Lives Matter and um, the uh, struggle for the liberation of Palestine. That's been incredible. And, you know, that, that, um, that collaboration is, is complicated, right? And so it, it requires that, um, you know, our own community look to our own, um, you know, uh, investment in white supremacy, perhaps, you know? Uh, I was really inspired by um, a panel. I think I would. I think it was last year um, um, about Black Iranians. That was incredible. You know, to uh, so so making these connections and you know digging into these um, conversations that are difficult to have, um, maybe within our own communities initially, um, and then like kind of expanding. So that's that's what I want to say about resources. I also wanted to take advantage of, of this uh, time to sort of acknowledge the kind of resources that have made all the work that I've been able to do, for instance, here uh, possible with the resources of all of these nonprofits and actually going back to individuals working within the nonprofits that I've had the good fortune of working with that have been there to support me to support my community beyond um, you know anything that I have received from my own community. I think the needs, I always justify this by saying that the needs of our community is so great that the art comes, you know, beyond entertainment doesn't really serve a purpose, even though um, I'm grateful that they come to the shows that are, of course, always free and, and you know, um, open to everybody's attendance. Um, beyond that, we don't really see the financial support of our own specific communities. But if people like Kevin Chen wasn't working with, uh, you know, Center for Art and Public Life and Intersection at a time and opened up their space, if... Um, uh, Courtney Fink and Valerie Imus at Sudden Exposure didn't open up, um, you know, and, and I can go on all of these Kearney Street workshop, like everybody here in the Bay Area has been beyond supportive and uh, been able to give us resources that otherwise didn't exist. So 
I also, shout out to yeah, and I also want to shout out to Mark Johnson because uh -huh. Mark Johnson for decades has also been doing this work. Um, right. I mean, I I want to keep naming people, make yeah. sure <laughs> you know, <laughs> and San Francisco Arts Commission for bringing you in to do with an exhibition, and we did an exhibition there last year, and yeah. on and on. Like all of this has happened, and all of the funders that have supported us in those ways. Um, we do need uh, more support from our communities. So I do leave it at that. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say that, you know, the shout out to both Kathy and Tyronid because you both have curated um, my work and supported me um, and many artists. Uh, and I think that um, it's very important to to have that institutional support, to have the um, grants available and more of like kind of not like projects here and there to have something more of a established that is specifically geared to support projects from the SWANA. You know, I think that we do see that in different forms for different communities and different regions, but I think that we, we do need that. And I think that, you know, it, it is, it's, it has been by the generosity of, you know, different um, spaces like such as Southern Exposure, you know, and Iranian Diaspora Studies at the center of that. And, and you know, again, like we have, we have a long list of names of how um, different um, um, organizations have supported this line of work, but I, I, yeah, money, we need money. We can't do this for free or very little. I mean, it's so unsustainable. Um, and in order to get even just, you know, I think that, that we can all speak to that being an artist, art historian and an educator. It is, a, it's a lot, you know, there's the um, uncertainty of, of um, not knowing whether if you're, when your contract ends, when should, or would I be like, that is a lot of, stress on us and you know we're looking at like one percent of hire for tenor um you know you know with faculty and the rest of us are just you know just trying to like survive and that is so hard so i really think again institutional money and you know and money more support yeah, so <laughs> I'll, I mean, yeah, I'll add on to that, that financial support. I mean, it's real and it's lacking. And um, I've gone through and I've tallied some of uh, sort of one of the major um, awards that sort of travels through different states and different cities. Um, and like, for example, the one in San Francisco um, has never had a single, for example, um, uh, I don't think they've had an Iranian artist ever, and I think maybe they've had one Swana artist, maybe in the past 20 years. And that's insane when you look at the tally. Or, you know, when you look at like universities, it's it's so insane. I mean, I'm I'm it's 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 absolutely it's 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 shocking. Um and so I think like both the money but also the pathways, you know, like the pathways and the money and or the financing, it's connected. If we don't have pathways to move towards places that we can better build our lives and our practices and each other, then we're really suffering. Um, and so I think, and which we are, <laughs> but one of, one of the, uh, the other, two other things is like, I think the intersectional aspect of resources is so important. And I think a lot of things points back to that building up as a community, but also building with other communities as well. Um, and one shout out I wanted to give was, uh, well, to to things like this, to Zamin Project and Shagher Sirus and what she's organized and brought together. Um, it's pretty amazing and much needed. And, um, and last year I was with Arab Amp. So I wanna give a shout out to Arab Amp and the work that Leah Mona Tawil is doing. And one of the things that was wonderful with working in that was that it was all experimentation. It was based on the person. It wasn't based on the product or what you produce. And I think that that is really important, which also reflects within, I think the classroom as well, is the fact that like sometimes like within that program, which was experimentalism, um, or even if we think about art, um, I think one of the things is like sometimes we're never going to be legible, <laughs> you know, like we're never going to be legible and that's actually okay. Um, being leg like that's fine and sometimes that's actually something to protect because when we move into certain places and programs and we're trying to make ourselves legible, it's legible from um, 
It's legible from white readership or white viewership. And it's legible from that aspect. So I think when we have more people and more intersectional connections and uh, pathways, we don't need to do that um, or have that pressure necessarily to fall into that. Um, and so I think that you know it's it's important to not mix up legibility with self visibility, accessibility, or equity. Um, but uh, I think yeah, the resources that support that are invaluable. So I think we have maybe, um, I'm not sure if we still have a question from the chat. So should, I'll go ahead and read it out loud and then maybe someone can respond to or, it. Or I think Trina or someone reading it. come in and right. support. Hi, you guys. <laughs> um, hi, um, my name is Trina Michelle Robinson and I am the Programming and Communications Associate here at Aggregate Space Gallery. And um, I'm an African American woman. My hair is pulled back at the top of my head. I have a little scarf on, and a black sweater, and a brown a brown sweater, and a black dress. And I will read the question that we do have. It's a one question with two parts um, from an anonymous attendee. I've noticed that women have dominated this three part series, and I wonder if you, I wonder if you could comment on the ways that we as women are invested in community building, mentorship, as well as bringing in others, including this idea of SWANA as a broad concept, um, how it's endemic or essential to our work as artists. If you could say something about how that has affected your field of work, your teaching, or in the ways you approach your art practice um, itself. And then um, the second part of that question is, uh, do you see it as affecting the way art is curated, produced, pervade and that going back to that women have dominated um, this conversation as opposed to having like a male um, commerce driven art world. If I may, I would like to uh, ask Shabar if she, if she wants to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. First of all, that was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you all um, for this meaningful and br brilliant conversation. It's, it's really interesting because a lot of people ask me if I intentionally picked uh, the panelists. It's not actually, it's, um, I just thought about the topics and like who would be the best uh, based on their work to put everyone together. So um, it was not intentional choice, but it happened to be all women panelists, which is exciting at the same time. I mean, I'll, I'll go on and um, say that I don't think necessarily like, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm naive or often, I don't know, like idealistic, but I feel that, uh, you know, in, in terms of sort of like as women, it's, I want maybe idealistic and thinking that it's not necessarily gendered that we're like invested in building in community building and sort of like bringing everyone in together um or at least from a very sort of like uh intrinsic sort of aspect uh but i think that more uh i mean it does seem to be a lot of women in the arts in the bay area and a lot of swana women in the arts in the bay area and um and i sort of think of it out of a necessity uh to build those spaces Yeah, it's a good question to reflect on because I always wonder, I'm like, where's everyone else? <laughs> where's like, yeah, where's everyone else? Where's the men or where's the gender non-conforming folks in general? I have to think about that, Persis. Um, I think that, yeah, there is something about, um, something about your question that, um, should be taken very seriously. Um, and uh, of course it's a generalization, um, which makes it kind of like uncomfortable to answer. Um, but I do, I do think that there is something to be said for, um, for our work, uh, for the way that our, our, our experience, our gendered experience and how it has um, supported us. And I'll also say that I have seen many um, 
women in the commerce driven art world. So I don't know, it's not about necessarily woman or man, but you know, a, a specific perspective on what success means maybe. That's interesting. I love the way you're putting it. I, my experience has been that um, in the community projects and collective projects that um, have organized, women have been forthcoming with help a lot more than um, you know others involved. Um, and I think it does go back to Kathy's response to how we define success. I think part of we, we seem to get a lot out of <laughs> these, these uh, conversations and have the need for it, perhaps, um, that maybe others um, don't, uh, depending on their communities and their resources. So I don't know if it's a gendered uh, response, but my experience has been pre predominantly working with women in organizing things, not necessarily representing women in exhibitions. But yeah, I'm mean, hundred percent. And I think that um, I can just, I'm just thinking about this panel, like we all know each other and we have a lot of overlaps and intersections with the line of work that we do. So it is not like, I mean, to me, uh, that was not the primary thought that I had in, in this seeing this series of panelists, for instance, that they all happen to be um, identified as women, um, so I think that it is a line of work that we all do and, and the relationship that we've been building over the years that brought us here, that is as opposed to like, all oh, woman, like, you know, panel or, uh, you know, and I mean, if you think about, it, I think that the inter interviews definitely are are diverse and, and well, I don't wanna say the word diverse, but it is, doesn't have the same reflection of like all women. But I think that there is something very important that we've all earned this position that we have been here and I think that um to me that it's like even I, I don't know like I, I think that we we aren't and deserve our, our place in the panel as opposed to just being all women so because of what we do uh, you know so yeah I do want to add on I think Percy John I think I'm going to be sitting with your question for a bit beyond this, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And it makes me wonder, is it out of necessity or is it out of like, which is the driving force? We do have one more question in the Q&A and then I, I think we'll close. Um, <laughs> but uh, the one question is, and this again, it's a two-parter. Um, as you all um, have mentioned, there's a lack of financial resources in the arts community, especially here in the Bay Area. What's your advice to the next generation of artists, mentors, and teachers who are inspired by you all and the others in the community, but are worried about balancing work and basic needs? And how do you manage to continue to do the work that you do in, the envi in this environment? Can I say that I've been really impressed with, um, you know, pe people who are younger, um, or you know, anyways, I, I, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I am older. <laughs> and this, anyways, so I'm stumbling a little. Um, a lot of people are, they'll, they'll say, no, I'm not going to do that without getting paid. You need to pay me. Um, and, you know, I'm often like, wow, that's so amazing and great and true. And, and then on the other hand, I'm like, but there are also opportunities, right, to, that you can gain. Um, and, you know, it's a fine line being um, exploited and um, identifying opportunities what, that you can exploit, right, <laughs> to use that word um, uh, loosely. So, um, yeah, I think like, you know, you, I, I just got a full-time tenure track job and I was shocked at how, um, how, how stressed I was. I didn't realize how stressed out I was um, 
you know, by working as a contingent faculty member. Um, and last year I was on the brink of quitting the arts um, and, and academia um, because it was just too much. I was just, I was feeling really resentful and angry. And um, so, but it's, you know, like Azin said, it's not, you know, like there aren't uh, enough full-time jobs. So maybe, you know, I would say get involved with your labor unions, right? You know, wherever you can advocate for um, a um, more equitable distribution of the resources, however you can do that. Kathy, I'm stressed, <laughs> still. <laughs> I, I work. <laughs> um, how do we make the work happen is by being stubborn. I think that that's pretty much um, uh, what drives everything. I, I don't think, um, you know, and, and being stubborn about the need and addressing the need that is there. And I feel like the more I've done this and the more I've become the person that can do this and has the experience to do it, the more responsible I have felt to keep doing it, even though it really is not sustainable. So uh, I am so glad that, you know, like Shariyar is doing, is curating, the younger generations are going after like organizing. I'm relieved and I'm um, very excited about the possibilities of where this can lead because um, I just hope that uh, it is sustainable for the next generation. We're there to support you, <laughs> you know, in any way that we can and collaborations and, um, you know, collective work and conversations and gatherings and all of that, as we know is necessary, um, is gonna have to happen and we're gonna make, come up with the resources. Um, and I think these panels that you've created hopefully will lead to the community coming together to support us. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I also want to add that if you were, I mean, you, Kathy and Tarana, you were not there, we, were, we wouldn't have this conversation at all. So like, shout out to you for putting all of us in connection, I mean, connected to each other and giving us opportunity at the first town and trusting us. <laughs> um, that's really important. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this amazing panel. Um, I'd love to hear everyone like uh, forever, but unfortunately we are out of time. And um, I want to thank Aggregate uh, Space Gallery, Trina Robinson, Conrad and Willis uh, Mayor again for um, all their support in the background. Um, also, all the panel, all the three panels will be recorded and they are recorded. Two of them are already on the YouTube channel. So you can, uh, if you didn't have a chance to join us online, you can uh, watch them. And uh, I posted the link into the chat um, and it's, there again, and this uh, panel will be also recorded. Um, and I mean, it's recorded already and <laughs> it's going to be published on the YouTube channel. Um, also from September 1st, there will be 15 interviews uh, that interviewed by one and only Rula Seykhali, um, who unfortunately couldn't jo uh, join us today, but we are sending love um, to her and will be posted on Aggregate Space Gallery's YouTube and uh, Zamin Instagram. Uh, so follow, subscribe, and um, stay in touch with all of us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.